Andy Wood has bluegrass in his bones. He's been playing mandolin since the single digits alongside his cousin Brian on fiddle and under the expert tutelage of their grandfather. Gramps, he wasn't formally trained in music, but he had expensive tastes and preferred the intricate articulation of bluegrass stars like Sam Bush on mandolin and Kenny Baker on fiddle. If Andy and Brian could learn bluegrass standards and get them notes clean, as Gramps would say, he'd bribe them with luxury. He'd take them to the bowling alley and give them five bucks each for the arcade. Gramsci got Fisher's Hornpipe, Andy and Brian got Martial Arts Mastery, and everyone was happy. Andy went on to compete in bluegrass competitions and placed second at the prestigious Walnut Valley Festival in Winfield, Kansas when he was just 16. So bluegrass, with its array of demanding standards like Fisher's Hornpipe, and Big Mon was the training ground that enabled all this flat picking skill. But Andy hadn't worked out these tunes regularly since his formative chop building years. And when we sat down to play through some examples, the renditions were totally off the cuff, which makes what we got all the more special. That would be like the length. That sounds great. I think we're ready to roll. We did these two takes of the bluegrass standard Red Haired Boy a couple hours apart with no click. In other words, we never actually intended for them to interlock this way as a single performance. This was simply something that popped into my mind when I was editing the footage. I thought, what would happen if I took the one take and dropped it right on top of the other take? And it's a band, a one-man band. They locked up perfectly like this for about 30 seconds, which is approximately here. After which point, those numbers you see on the screen are the numbers of video frames I had to chop out of the guitar side of the performance to keep them both lined up. Now for reference, one frame of video is a 30th of a second, so you can see just how small and infrequent these edits really are. At the end of the mandolin performance, Andy starts to slow down. It's not a mistake, it's an intentional retardando to create an ending. Even given that, with just a three frame edit to the guitar side, very cool. It's worth noting that the reason these two takes lock up is not because Andy is playing a super consistent computer-like tempo. He's actually speeding up and slowing down. And this is pretty common when you look at great musical performance that were not done to a click. Just for kicks, I once mapped out all the tempo changes in the Star Wars end titles. It's crazy how variable it is, even within sections where the written tempo is constant. The key is that all the players are speeding up and slowing down together. So it's not a mess, it's just exciting. In similar fashion, what's cool about the Red Haired Boy performance is not that it's consistent, but that Andy is speeding up and slowing down with himself together. The ebb and flow of the tempo in this tune is stored in his brain similarly on both instruments, and he is somehow able to recall both the starting tempo and the subsequent changes with no reference. The synthesized duet sounded so cool, I decided to try this with the other standards we played on both instruments. In Whiskey Before Breakfast, there were a couple of stylistic pauses in the guitar version that simply were not there in the mandolin version. So I had to chop out a small slice of time at two points. But aside from that, the tempos were essentially the same and the edits were similar. A frame or two here or there and things lined up pretty well. Jerusalem Ridge was a little different. These versions were played at slightly different bass tempos. They were also much longer than the other tunes, over two minutes, but I really liked both takes on this and I wanted to see what they sounded like lined up. So I had to do some tempo mapping and logic. Once that was done, the differences in the arrangements turned out to be remarkably few. The guitar part had a pair of extra strums in it about halfway through. 
This amounted to a measure of five among the fours. Or if you're mapping this in a fast 4-4, four, four, as I probably should have done to get the traditional bluegrass eighth note pulse, you'd end up with an additional measure of two. This occasional measure of two is part of the way Jerusalem is often interpreted. You can hear one on Kenny Baker and Bill Monroe's classic 1977 recording that connects the B section to the C section. This is part of the mind game that bluegrass often plays with time, where a tune might be played in four, but with the strong pulse of the bass on the one and three, you can almost hear the whole thing in two. And this duality is definitely something Andy plays with on both guitar and mandolin. So this was simply an extra occurrence of that. In addition to this, the mandolin repeats the melody at the very end as a kind of tag. Whereas the guitar part just plays it once. And finishes. Once I remove these two differences, the strum and the tag, the two performances aligned right up. It's worth noting that this isn't a traditional bluegrass arrangement with rhythm and lead. It's essentially two lead performances happening simultaneously and it makes the melody section sound ever so metal. The more expository solo sections happen a little further in, and even though both instruments are off doing different things, the energy level is appropriately higher at that point. And that's just it. Ultimately, editing the duets was a lesson in arrangement. Even in their unrehearsed form, Andy clearly has a concept for these tunes that flows, with a beginning, a middle, and an end that takes you on a little journey. And that, more so even than the blazing technique, is why he's such a great musician. <laughs>